Welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. We have special guests here in the studio. This is Rebecca and Megan from Larkin Poe. Hi. That's Great to have you here. Great to be here. So you're uh, you're playing a show at the Coliseum here in Fort Wayne tonight. We are. We're open up for Mr. Bob Seeger, and we're nice. so excited. Nice. Have you been out with Bob for a while? We have been. Coming up on... Month and a half. Month and a half. Yeah. All yeah. Right. All right. And then you're heading out on a cruise, right? We are. Before we do the cruise, actually, we're going down. Bob Weir invited us to play down with Dead & Company at their festival in Cancun. So we're going to be going from this kind of snowy, icy weather straight to the beach. So nice. we're going to try not to get sunburned. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, we're glad you're here. Thanks for taking time to, oh. uh, to stop by. I saw you out checking out the slide. Amazing. Out in the, uh, out in the uh, mall out there. So. Yeah. Truly, <laughs> what, a, what a beautiful campus. It is something, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I say that every day. I come to work, I'm like, wow, it's pretty cool. Yeah, pretty very. Cool. So I'm, I'm uh, interested in uh, looking at your careers and, and the development of, of your music and things. There's kind of been three stages that I see there. There was your very early years when you were doing classical music, mm -hmm. and then your kind of bluegrass acoustic years, and mm -hmm. now the electric years, we'll say. So tell us a little <laughs> bit about that development and that progression. We would have been 12, 13 with bluegrass. And mm -hmm. growing up in the South, of course, there's so many bluegrass festivals around. And we were really bowled over by um, the joy, the spontaneity of bluegrass music. Mm -hmm. And that's when we first started our little band went out to jams. As classical kids, it was a very interesting transition, very painful, but so worth it. Right. And I picked up mandolin, and you would have picked up slide guitar, banjo for me. Um, and we started our first band, the Lovell Sisters, with a big sister, Jess. Right. And toured for six years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then she decided to, to step away from music mm -hmm. and try something else. And that's when the two of us kind of stepped back and decided if we wanted to continue in music, and we, we definitely both did. Mm -hmm. And that's when Lark and Poe po came into existence in 2010. Yeah. Right, right. But you said you got into it, but you, were, you really got into it. You were playing in uh, competitions on oh, mandolin, yes. and, and you guys were taking a deep dive into the deep, instruments. And the, deep, deep dive. And so, so cool because, I mean, that was really the beginning of our love affair with American roots music, you know? I think growing up in the South, feel so fortunate to be steeped in those musical traditions and, right. you know, dipping down deeper into the delta and the cradle of rock and roll. And for us, that's um, when our imaginations really took off in mm -hmm. wanting to write our own songs and wanting to make our own band and to be artists that would continue the tradition of roots American music. Because, of course, our dad, like most American kids, I feel like, our dad was playing as Tom Petty and Fleetwood Mac and Black Sabbath and Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, like kind of a, a wash of rock music that mm -hmm. at that point in time, as you know, young teenagers, we didn't understand how heavily all of these bands were pulling from the blues. Mm -hmm. um, and so for us, in the last two, three years, trying to dive deeper into understanding the history of blues music and doing our due diligence and educating ourselves on who were inspiring the Allman Brothers, you know, what artists were they listening to? Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, when we finally feel like we're coming home and figuring out what it means to be Larkin Poe. Right. What, what is the attraction to that roots music, to like the Delta Blues, you know, going back to that first stage as opposed to later along in the development or starting right at the Allman Brothers? Well, I mean, mostly I would say it was because of the sly guitar. I mean, we grew mm -hmm. up listening to Dwayne, obviously, and whenever Megan decided to make that her main focus, and it was such a natural thing for you. Mm -hmm. Like, I tried to play slide, and it's hard. Right. It's really <laughs> difficult, but right. you took it to it like a fish to water, and that was a big informer for us, playing the blues, I feel like. And, and also for me as a singer, um, I revere, like, Robert Johnson and the way that he approaches songs, and Skip James, and the way that... You know, lyrically and emotively, when you're singing, you're you're singing about the soul and the timelessness of that. I think it's just infectious. Right, right. 
Megan, you went from Dobro to the Electric Lab Steel. Mm -hmm. How did one inform the other? What was the progression there? Well, I knew I wanted to, to try a heavier sound, and the lap steel was sort of the obvious choice. So mm -hmm. I just tuned the lap steel like the Dobro and kind of went from there, and which I think isn't a too terribly common tuning on, on the lap steel. Right. I think I've run into one other person that uses a Dobro tuning on lap steel. But for me, it was an, it was an easy transition. I mean, it, there was a transition in that I was not used to play, plugging in and playing through an amp and you know playing with pedals and distortion and all these these things these new tricks that you can kind of <laughs> delve into right. but um, yeah it was I love the vocal quality of the lap steel and I did grow up listening to like Lindley um, mm -hmm. an amazing slide player so for me it was like this new love affair right. um, Right. Yeah. Was it more from people like David Lindley, who was, all, who was playing lap steel, mm -hmm. versus uh, someone playing more slide guitar, or were you trying to integrate the two of those? I think that um, it would have started out with like Derek Trucks, like okay. listening to his slide, and then later on realizing that these, these songs that I was hearing, like Lindley solo on Running on Empty, not realizing that what that was, mm -hmm. and then later on, oh, it's the lap steel. This is, this is the sound that I've been looking for. Right, 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 that's so cool. Rebecca, I read, I read an interesting quote from you where you said that you couldn't write on mandolin <laughs> because you were too focused on playing, and that was one of the things yeah. that moved you toward guitar. Can you expand on that a little bit? You know, when we started our band, neither Megan nor I actually wanted to even be from people or to be singers. We were always so focused instrumentally, mm -hmm. um, wanting to be players um, above all else. And for me, I think that really took root with the mandolin. Um, you know, following in the footsteps of trying to listen to Chris Thiele and cop some of his riffs and players of that caliber. And, and for me, I think songwriting sometimes gets a little bit trod on if you're just focused on learning hot licks. So that really was initially my reason for transitioning to guitar was to have more of a writing tool mm -hmm. where I wasn't sitting down and just shedding my scales and getting sucked into that deep, dark hole of practicing. Um, right. And so for many years and continuing, I'm still a really bad guitar player. But, you know, like it's serving its purpose for writing. And now, of course, I've gotten guitar fever, like everyone right. else who actually, I think, steps into the realm of what it means to be an electric guitar player and how many role models and heroes you can find. Right. So I've been trying to expand my chops on the guitar in addition to, to writing, because I am the main songwriter for the band mm. and wanting to do justice to both roles. Right, right. Uh, Ricky Skaggs was just here, and I had a chance to actually take a mandolin lesson with him. Ricky, but I, I'm yeah. a guitar player, and oh, yeah. so going the other direction is, to me, it's difficult because it's upside down, right? That's with the true. Tune, the <laughs> For me, going to, from mandolin to guitar, it was so strange. It's like, why is there a B string here? Right. Because I'm so, I was so, from violin to mandolin, so dominated by thinking in fifths, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Ricky Skaggs. Yeah, yeah, no one amazing. like him. Right, right. So tell us a little bit more about the songwriting process. Do you start with the music? Do you start with lyrics? Do you, how do you work together on the songs? We always end up working together on songs. We are true collaborators with the band and as sisters and as creative collaborators and producing our records now. But I'm, I am the main songwriter and, and I think that's the beauty of creativity is that it never quite strikes the same twice. So maybe some, someday you're, you're struck by a lyrical idea and the next it's by the music and to me that's what keeps me coming back is the diversity and being willing to let songs take root however they need and to be patient with it, because that's the biggest, I feel like, tool to learn as a songwriter is the patience. Um, I, I feel like, especially as a young writer, the inclination is to button it up quick and to write the song and muscle it out. And then you hear of songwriters who, you know, dabbled on songs for four or five years. Like, I think that's the story about the dance that Garth Brooks hit, you mm -hmm. know, the guy who wrote that song like toyed with it for years on end until finally it becomes the masterpiece that it needs to be. Right. So I'm, I'm working on the patience bit. Right. I'm working right. on that. So how much of a difference is there between your concept of the song to when you do the final arrangements that go on the recordings? Interestingly, um, at this point in Lark and Poe, they're virtually indistinguishable. Mm -hmm. um, I think especially with the advent of beat making and, you know, garage band and all the different platforms upon which you can build beats and create the beds for tracks. Um, growing up in Atlanta, we, we obviously hung out with a lot of, of, you know, people who were more into urban music and the rap scene and these big, larger-than-life sounds, and we kind of mm. got 
lit up by some of the larger than life sound palettes like the 808s and, and big um, snare sounds. And for, for me, learning to recreate beats for the band in the last two years, the last two records that we've made, I would build up the demos for the songs and oftentimes those were the tracks that we would then eventually bring into the studio to build on top. Mm -hmm. So from conception to completion, like they're pretty much the same. If anything, we, <laughs> we take away from yes. the original because <laughs> we, we love uh, old strip back blues recordings and right. how sometimes it's just a guitar and a voice mm -hmm. or just a voice. So we love that stripped back nature. So if, if anything in our recordings, it's more about what can we take away? Yeah, learning how to call comfortably and be comfortable right. with space. Right, you can hear that difference in the, the progression between Peach and Venom and Faith yeah. of coming into more of the, the beats and things that are in there. But you managed to blend very well the, the authentic Thank you. Roots, roots vibe with the more contemporary production, I would say. Uh, tell us about how your ears are orienting in that way. Where do you say we're going too far in getting too contemporary, or we're, or we're not going far enough, or, or the progression between the two That's albums. That's a great that question. Way. And I think it's something that, as sisters and, and the musical bond that we share, that oftentimes informs the gut instinct. And, you know, we've known each other since we were babies, literally. And so we know when each of us is being authentic. Sure. And so when we have some sort of a barometer, like the, the BS barometer between us, where we're like, <laughs> that doesn't feel like us, or, ah, oh, you're kind of putting on airs with that, or, no, your ego is getting in the way. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. in that way, I think as sisters, it's easier to, to find true north whenever we're in the studio working. And I do believe that whenever we decided to produce the last two records, we felt so liberated. And, and even though it's, it's a very challenging process as an artist sometimes to produce yourself, um, we felt like that was the right decision for us. Mm -hmm. In a way, being responsible for all the creative decisions that needed to be made, it, it means that ultimately our fans are getting the truest version of us and, right. and our very distinct musical perspective. So we're really just kind of fumbling our way through. <laughs> it works, right? Well, works. thank you. But, there's a, but there is a consistency when you do your, uh, for example, your Tip of the Hat video series yeah. where it was the two of you, you know, doing very stripped down performances to the, the more produced, produced records, it doesn't feel like the produced elements are tacked on to the rest of that. It's, well, it's all very, very cohesive and very coherent. So I think that's an achievement because a lot of times it feels that way, right? It feels mm -hmm. like somebody's sticking a hip hop beat under a, uh, under a, a blues song. So and we a, want it to be organic. We want, you know, in, in as much as we are a female fronted blues band in the 21st century, what does that mean, you know? Trying to define that in a way that is, that is authentic to us that is respectful to the tradition, and that is hopefully something new, a new taste, a new perspective, you know, for people to dig into. Sure, sure. Speaking of the tradition, Peach, you were half covers and half originals, and there's two covers on the, uh, on the new uh, album. What makes you choose a song and say, this is gonna be a great cover for us to do? For both, they've been covers that we've done in our, in our Tip of the Hat, Tip of the Hat series. Mm -hmm. That you mentioned. And they're just songs that we feel like we wish we had written. Yes, absolutely. And they feel like, just, they feel like Larkin Poe to us. So they feel right to go on the record. And, and we do like um, the, the tip of the hat to the past with right. including the covers. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, you've, you've found some interesting songs to work through, but there's also an element of making them your own. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. How do you look at a song and say, this is what we need to do for it to sound like us and for it to be on our, on our uh, recording. Because that's a very fine dance, how to do it respectfully, how to take someone's song and make it your own without clobbering all over what like, the essence of the song is and how right. the artist intended it. But for Luckily, us, it has been yeah. a very organic thing. It's just the two of us sitting in a room and just playing it. And it's kind of mm -hmm. like what comes out. Like we don't have to work too terribly hard at thinking about, oh, what should it be or what shouldn't it be? It's kind of like what it is. But I think that that's also a function of having done so many Tip of the Hats at this point. Like that's why we started doing that video series was to learn ourselves better by learning other people's songs. I mean, that's how you get better at anything. It's, you know, you pedal the bike around the neighborhood countless times, you play that, you know, ACDC riff 1800 times in order to right. get the muscle memory. And so for us, learning other people's songs, we were building up the muscle memory of who we are as artists. And then being able to just sort of throw that blanket of Larkin and Poe over someone else's song. Right, right. So there's the development of the music and the performances, but there's also the development of the, 
we'll say the business side of, of the, uh, sure. the equation as well. And you guys are very active in social media with your, all your videos and uh, you know, Instagram and all the different things. Talk a little bit about the impact of social media on what you've done. I think it's huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, we live in an era in which you cannot opt out of the system of social media, truly. You know, especially in the business that we're in. And so you can either be mad about it or you can embrace it. And for us, I think we've been trying to, to embrace it and see the power that a social media platform can create between us and our fans and that kind of an interaction. But people have, people have been really supportive mm -hmm. and they've loved the videos. Mm -hmm. the, they've loved the bedroom cover videos. Um, and we've seen, you know, a direct sort of impact yeah. on our ticket sales. Mm -hmm. Like, because as some of those videos have actually gone viral, um, we've had like huge support in the real world. Yeah. <laughs> in the real world. Well right, said, yeah. Right, right, right. You've also had support from some pretty heavy hitters through the years, starting with Elvis Costello mm -hmm. and, and uh, moving on there. Tell us a little bit about that, the, the connection with, with Elvis and then uh, some of the other players that you've, uh, yeah. that you've encountered and worked with. Well, as we've discovered, sort of Elvis is the fount of blessings that never stops because he, as an artist, is so well connected that he has made many introductions for us. He's been such a mentor for us over the years. We met Elvis when I was... Over a decade ago. Yes, yeah, 17, 18, 16, 17, 18, thereabouts. Mm -hmm. At the Bluegrass Festival. Yes. And we were doing this all-star jam, and um, we happened to be kind of paired with him um, because they will have like a lot of the artists that are playing that day maybe come up and jam on some songs. So we, we got to jam with him, and um, he, he really liked our precociousness and <laughs> sort of invited us out on the road. And it, after that, it's been, I guess, the last decade, pretty much every year, some sort of a, of a tour or a recording session or something, you know, and mm -hmm. we respect him hugely. I think that there aren't many artists that you and I share who are in our wheelhouse of just, this is our guy. Just in right. awe The of breadth him. of song that he has written over the years and right. his fearlessness in making whatever records he, wanna, he wants to make he totally disregards genre stereotype, like he goes from making a country record to a punk record to whatever. And that has been a huge role model for us over the years. And um, I'm trying to think, I guess next in the line would have been T-Bone Burnett. T-Bone Burnett through Elvis. T-Bone has called us for a bunch of right. session work over the years. With the, the basement years. tapes, correct? That's and that was an amazing it. experience. Steven right. Tyler's country record. Mm -hmm. And I guess Russell Crowe, the actor, would have been in Atlanta making a movie. I love that story about Russell Crowe. This is so <laughs> funny. And so Elvis said, oh, like while you're in Atlanta, you got to check out these Atlanta girls that I love. They're my girls. You know, listen to their music, Lark and Poe. Right. And so Russell did, and, and Russell has now introduced us to many people. He bought our records and gave them to me um, Neith, <laughs> Keith and Nicole. Right. Um, <laughs> Neith, Neith, you know, just the package deal. Known that way forevermore. Right? And, and so he sent our records to them as a couple, and, and Keith called us up and asked us to go out on tour with him over this summer, or last summer. Mm. Amazing, his graffiti U, Canadian and U.S. legs of the tour. Right. And, and also tip of the hat would have been, I guess, the touchstone for Mr. Bob Seeger to find out about us, mm -hmm. which was amazing. One of the first videos to go viral was Preachin' Blues mm -hmm. on a Sunhouse cover. And he saw that and, and called up our team and asked if we would come out and support him. Right. So for us, it's, it's just been an amazing spider web, butterfly wing echo effect of just people being willing to share their energy and Right. You know, their mentorship for us over the years. But you have to be ready, you have to be prepared to deliver when you get oh, you put, in, put into that situation. Yeah, because if you're showing up and you're sleeping on opportunity, then no one's going to call you again. Right. And luckily our parents raised us to, to show up and work hard. <laughs> right, right, that's awesome. I, I uh, enjoyed that with Keith Urban, you weren't just opening, you also came up and did a feature spot in the middle of his concerts. The feature spot, playlist, right? yeah, we were the, the, the featured, featured guests. guests. Yeah, and it was it was really fun to get up and jam with him every night because I think for a tour of that scale, you know, when you go and you see Keith Urban show, you were seeing an amazing production, top of the line, and um, the portion in which we would pop up with with Keith, it was one of the most unscripted bits of the night, which I think everyone kind of needed just a breath for things to be a little haywire. Right. So we always loved being the haywire element of the Keith tour. Right, that's oh, gonna be fun. <laughs> also, sure. doing six months of that really desensitized us to playing in front of a, such a huge audience as that, yeah. these arenas. So it's been amazing kind of going from that tour onto the Bob Seger tour, where it's, where it's definitely more of our own thing. Um, 
and and knowing knowing how to kind of move on that big of a stage. Right. Yeah. Right. Got our wireless packs and we're good to go. <laughs> yeah. Right. So you, I meant to ask you earlier, uh, uh, Megan. The uh, you play a Rickenbacker B6, mm -hmm. and it looks like you've got an extension on that that allows you to play that standing up. Was that something you came up with? Yeah, I wanted to be able to stand, and so a family friend helped me build that. Um, so I kind of just drew. Actually, the shape of it is the sh just the shape of a dobro, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they, we found a way to kind of slot the lap steel into that so into that into holder. The, yeah, oh, that's cool. that's it's very, very it janky, works. and there's only one. There's only one. I gotta there make was another. One time when <laughs> it got left in New York City on a gig. And the next couple of gigs were very awkward for our, our I slide I had to play queen. without it. It right. was not good. Yeah, you right. need to you get more have made. Backup. <laughs> got to have a backup. So I, I always like to ask in these interviews when, uh, when uh, artists like yourselves are here that are working on a very high level and interacting with high level artists, Bob Seger, uh, uh, Keith Urban, Elvis Costello, T1 Burnett, what is it that defines a great artist like that? It's multi-hued and it's different for each artist. But I think for us, the takeaway has been the tirelessness, mm -hmm. the courtesy, the passion for the music. Tenacity. The tenacity. Knowing your stuff. Like all of these people is just, their music just is historians. incredible. Like right. from Keith Urban, who is an incredible musician. And he, he works tirelessly at his craft and wants to make sure his show is just so for his fans. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, to, to watch people who have that who have that passion after being in, being in this profession for many, many years, it's, it's incredible. And I think also another shared factor is that these people, they remain curious, you know? Like mm -hmm. in addition to loving making music, they're willing to reinvent themselves and to change and to tweak and to toy with what it means to be their own brand. And, and that I think is really exciting when you see somebody who's been in the business for as long as like Bob Seger Right. And Bob Seger still goes on Facebook and like looks at little band videos of you know some sister <laughs> duo out of Atlanta and right. bothers to take note and be like, right. oh, I'm curious, like what are they about? I, lo I love that. I want right. to be that way. That's very inspiring. Very inspiring. Well, congratulations on all your success and uh, <laughs> thank you for taking the time to stop by here. The new album is Venom and Faith. Mm -hmm. I definitely want to, want to check that out because it's uh, it's incredible and all, all your music is, has been very incredible. So we're, we're so happy you stopped by. Thank you so much. Thank Our you. pleasure. Thank you. Right, and have a great show tonight. Thank you. All right. And thank you for joining me for the Sweetwater Minute. I'm Mitch Gallagher. What you gonna do for them bleach blood, not the blues? How you gotta ride it? Feel the fire like the first kiss. Oh, you got to ride at your own risk. You got to ride at your own risk. Oh, you got to die. Yeah, you go and live it while you get it. Oh, you got to ride at your own risk. You got to ride at your own risk. You got to ride at your own risk. You got the right at your own risk. Hey, brother, get on it. <laughs>